Um, I am just so grateful for the opportunity to be here today. And uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Andrew Miracle, but he goes by Andrew. I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that he has both a PhD and a JD. That's takes That's what, a lot 10 of years. That's, That's 10 years of schooling, school. just that. Means your parents are going, are you ever going to get a job? <laughs> right. Are you just going to keep going to school? Right. Um, I work with a lot of really smart people, as you can tell. Um, but I, we're delighted today to talk to you about intellectual property, or we call it IP, and how to protect that IP once you develop it. OK, so um, before we get started, though, let me see a show of hands. How many of you are students? OK. And how many of you are with the university in some capacity? Com some capacity. OK, great. And then how many of you are, are out in the business world uh, working at various companies? Oh, terrific. OK, great. So we'll try to adjust our presentation to suit all audiences, both those who are less familiar with IP and those who are very familiar with IP. So um, before I get started, though, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about our firm. It's Kenobi, Martins, Olson, and Bear. It's a, it's a handful. But just remember, it rhymes with, it's, well, it sounds like Obi-Wan Kenobi. OK, not, it's not Nobby, it's Kenobi. And uh, we've been around for over 50 years. We're based in Orange County, California. And all we do is IP law. We do both prosecution. We get trademarks for companies. We help them with branding. But the bulk of our work is in the patent area. And that's what we're going to talk about mostly today, is how to protect your innovations, your inventions with patents. Okay? And we have, we're, we're different than other law firms because, as I said, that's all we do. And we're probably one of the largest. We're definitely the largest in California, but one of the largest in the nation and maybe even the whole world, I think, in terms of just having IP lawyers. We have uh, about 280 lawyers who have technical backgrounds. And they're in such varied backgrounds, everything from agriculture, as Andrew's in, to biotechnology, to medical devices, and computer science. And so just about anything that you might innovate, we have a lawyer that could help you potentially protect that with, with patent protection. Um, and so we were a perfect fit for the University of Hawaii. And years ago, um, we met the folks in the tech transfer office and told them what we might be able to help them with. And now it's been about, we've done about 50 uh, projects for them, about, gotten about 50 patents for the university. So it's wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderful partnership. We're very appreciative for it. And we love coming to Hawaii. So <laughs> <laughs> we're happy to be here. I also went to UH Law School, the William S. Richardson School of Law. So I'm very homegrown. I went to IEA High School. So that was way back when. And thank you, Peter, for not, not sharing or reminding people of my graduation year. But I've been around a long time. But I'm very, very proud of where I came from. And I think I, I just had a tremendous um, basic education in business here. And that has helped me throughout my career because I ended up being a corporate lawyer. And so I wasn't afraid to review financial statements or to try to understand you know, the finances of a company. I did some sophisticated work, like leverage leasing. I did unsophisticated work, like bank loans and public offerings, everything in between. So, but I got my start here. And so that's the wonderful thing about Scheidler. It's even better now than when I was attending. Scheidler, because um, we only had certain majors both here and at the university. But now you have so much to choose from and wonderful programs like PACE. So it's great that you're here. So let's get started. Um, I, just, I just say there's a, we've got a lot to talk about. We've got a bunch of slides. And we can really just touch on, on each of the aspects of, of IP, a bunch of different aspects. But if anybody has questions or wants us to stop and talk about something a little more, we're happy to do that. And then, of course, afterwards, we can also talk some more about anything yeah, that's interesting. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love for this to be more of a conversation than you know, just a Yeah, if there are particular things that you're interested in, in finding out a little more about, feel free to interject. Great. So um, I'm going to be um, introducing the first portion. And um, Andrew, Andrew's going to give some color commentary like they do <laughs> with football games. Um, so let's get started. So uh, today, the plan. OK, if I can get there, maybe I'm pressing the wrong button. There we go. OK, our plan for today is to talk about where IP issues arise, 
some considerations that you should take into account very early on in your process with your startups. Um, the various types of IP, um, I mentioned some patents and trademarks, but there are many more types. Um, freedom to operate, that's a term that you will hear over and over again, especially if you have the good fortune of having investors interested in your company, and Andrew's going to go over what that means. Um, it's very important at the onset to confirm who the owner of your technology is, as well as who invented your technology. You might have an employee, an R&D guy, or a a software coder, they call it these days, not programmers, who developed your code. And they may have, they may be an inventor, but they're not necessarily the owner of that IP. And that's a real important distinction. Um, and then we're going to talk about assignments and licenses. And you know, hopefully at some point, you may decide you want to sell your technology, which would be an assignment. Or you might want to lend it to another company that would pay you money to use it. And that's called a license. Okay, and then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about budgeting because uh, you know you you can't do any of this unless you've properly budgeted to pay for the expenses of protecting your IP. In some cases, it's very low cost, so don't don't worry. But budgeting is always something to keep into. And I would and I would suggest just interject for sure, a second absolutely. that with budgeting doesn't. If you go show up at the lawyer's office, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to start charging you $700 an hour as soon as you show up. If you've got an issue before it becomes a problem for you, run it by somebody. And that might just be you know, going and saying hello and saying, you know, can I talk to you about this and spend just a little bit of time. Um, so don't think, oh, by budgeting means oh, I've got to have $100,000 to go and, and before I even approach somebody. I would say if, you, if there's something you're thinking about, you know, check in and say, okay, is this something we need to talk about now or, or not? And figure out, you know, the lawyers will work with you to figure out what your budget is, how much you can spend with them, how much you should be thinking about something uh, at the time. Right, and so. oftentimes you have several calls or meetings with your potential clients before they actually end up, before you actually end up being engaged and charging them. Yeah, that's right. And oftentimes we can direct people and steer them and say, okay, before you really come in and we start getting into this, why don't you think about, Think about this and, and take a look at that. And OK, I know somebody else is working on this. Have you, have you checked that out? And sometimes that, uh, you know, that changes the direction of things. And, and maybe they, they come in right away, or maybe it's another year they go in and then they come back a little later. And they've had a chance to think things through a little bit. OK, great. All right, so um, the first topic is when do these issues arise? So they can arise at any given time. It could be when you're building your business up. It could be when you're designing your products and manufacturing them. And then they could arise when you've got your IP. Let's say you've got some patents, and your biggest competitor is copying your invention. They're selling copycat products. They're infringing your patents. What do you do then? OK, how do you stop them? So these, these IP issues arise at, can arise at those three points in time. In terms of when you're building your business, um, the most important thing at that point to think about is what, what have you innovated? What have you invented? What's the technology that you developed? And you need to think about protecting that right away. We're going to go into a little bit more detail about that. But one of the best ways of protecting your, in, your inventions is by pursuing patent protection by filing a patent application. And we'll go into that. Um, also, there's just basics of starting your business. And I know many of you who have started businesses have already gone through this. So we're, we're teaching you something you already know. But you need to um, figure out what your business name is. We'll talk about what a good trademark is and what a less good trademark is. Um, you need to think about your product lines and um, you know what, what innovations you have associated with each of those product lines, as well as branding for those product lines. And then marketing, of course, which, um, which you can uh, learn the basics of from Scheidler. And then you also need to think about your competitors. What IP might they have that might stop you from doing what you want to do? Something to think about. And then um, very, very important when, and I'm going to say when, be optimistic, when you get to the point where you're able to raise funds through angel investors, friends and family later on, uh, venture capital companies later on, private equity firms. IP is critically important. That's one of the first things that they're going to ask you in what they call due diligence. It's a process of understanding the company that the investors will want to do before they give you their money. Otherwise, they'd be foolish, right? 
but understanding what patent protection you have if you have patents or what trade secrets you have and understanding that you've registered your brands is critically important to those VCs or those investors. They won't invest unless you, you are sophisticated enough to think about those issues and to protect your IP. Um, also on product design and manufacturing, um, we mentioned freedom to operate. So that's a process of determining what's out there. So um, for example, if you were going to um, make a medical device that stops sleep apnea. What you're going to want to do, probably, is do a search of all the patents in the sleep apnea space and make sure that what you developed hasn't already been developed. Because if it has, and it's the subject of a patent, and you make that device, you may end up infringing the other party's patents. So you do have to be careful, not just to protect your own IP, but to make sure that you don't step on the toes of others who have patents. Because what can happen is you launch your product, and the first thing you get is a cease and desist letter, or even worse, you could get a lawsuit that you're infringing their patent. So a freedom to operate analysis will involve searching for patents in the area of, of your particular business to make sure that that's not already something that other people have done and have patent protection on. OK, it's, there's no guarantees that everything will be uncovered, but it'll give you a good sense as to what's out there. Um, notice letters, you know, in the process of designing and manufacturing, if one of your competitors gets wind that you're actually planning a certain product and they're upset about it, they may send you a cease and desist letter. What could that say? It could say that you're infringing their, tra their um, patent that you're infringing their trademark if you're branding it similarly to their brand. Um, they might say you stole their trade secrets. We've seen a lot of situations where an employee uh, leaves his, company, his or her company, goes and starts their own company, and then they get hit with a trade secret misappropriation lawsuit. So that's something to consider. I don't want to scare you, but that, that sort of thing can happen. Okay? Um, and then there's, there's what we call design arounds, and that is um, you know you want to make a product, and you know there's patents out there that kind of cover this certain product if it has you know, three legs on the product. And so you might decide, OK, I'm going to build my product with just two legs or four legs. And that might be good enough to what we call design around that other patent and get you away from infringing that patent. That is what a design around is. Okay, it's it's get and we can help with that. We help you when you're designing your product to make sure that it's unique and that it doesn't infringe other people's patents. And that might be a manufacturing process too. If you're thinking about making something in a certain way, and you'd have to pay somebody a, a royalty every time you made that, or to use their methodology, you might be able to come up with a different way of getting to the product that you want without having to pay a royalty, pay a license fee to somebody else for for using that methodology. And then um, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention enforcement. That's hopefully way down the line. But once you get a good set of patents and you, know, you start having some success with your product line, you may end up being the target, uh, or I'm sorry, you may end up having competitors um, want to copy your products. And you might decide to use the patents that you got in order to assert those patents in a lawsuit against your competitor. Sometimes you could just send a letter saying, um, we invite you to license our patent, and you know we won't charge you very much. And maybe that'll end any kind of dispute, if you're cool with them making a competitive product. Um, but many times, you don't want your competitor making the same product. And so litigation enforcement may be the only way to go. But that's very, very expensive, extremely expensive. And so the best thing, obviously, would be to try to find a way um, to get your competitor to stop um, uh, uh, infringing. Um, and then finally, just, just to mention, just so that you can sound smart when you talk to somebody tomorrow, there's this fairly new thing called an IPR. And so if your company gets sued for infringing a third party's patents, a competitor's patents, and you think those patents are invalid, and you have a reason to believe they're invalid because somebody else already had a patent on that then you could file an action with uh, a certain agency of the federal government called the PTAB. 
and you can file what's called an, an inter-parties review. And that could basically stop any lawsuit from proceeding against you and instead take that patent into an IPR and the um, PTAB may decide, you're right, that patent's invalid. So guess what? You don't, you don't infringe that patent if it's invalid. And that's a way of getting out of trouble. And it's far, far less costly than litigation. Okay? So you can tell your friends you learned about IPRs. I've heard that's a way that's actually bogging up the system right now. It is bogging up the system. And a lot of patent litigators are twiddling their thumbs because it used to be a patent infringement lawsuit hit. And they're busy. They're defending it. Um, you know, it's full speed ahead, but now all of a sudden it's like, hurry up and oops, stop what you're doing because now the IPR has been, um, is proceeding and we have to wait for the outcome of that. And, and you know, quite often, and we've been very successful in, in shooting down patents through the IPR process. We've also been very successful in, in preventing our clients' patents from getting shot down. But it, it's a process. It takes a while. How long does it take typically? these days? It's at least a year. At least a year. Um, it's, it's on a fairly fast pace, so there are yeah. strict deadlines, so they keep it moving, but, <coughs> but nevertheless, it puts the whole litigation on hold and, and brings everything to a stop, and then But and it's, an, it's it also out. an opportunity to settle a lawsuit during that dependency of that IPR. Okay. All right, so, um, you know, IP is really something that you should view as giving yourselves a competitive advantage. Yes, Tian? Sure. Um, sure. Who is the agent? So is the USPTO the agency that's responsible for the IPR review as well? Um, no, it's something called the Patent and Patent Trials and Appeal Board. Board. So it's, it's, it's a, sort of a branch of the PTO. It's the appeals There's these administrative division. law judges that are usually former patent attorneys. Patent. That's a re-examination I think you're thinking of. There's yeah. two different ways. You can actually have, you can throw a patent into re-exam, re which would be the USPTO, the Patent and Trademark Office, and they would actually start examining your patent again to see whether it's patentable. Okay. Yes, yeah, Nor. So, I'm sorry. Nor? Yes. Sure. Um, let's say uh, you work in some medical company and then you're starting your own mm -hmm. and you brought to work experience mm -hmm. experience to a new startup and now your old company um, for whatever reason suing you um, do you financially for this new startup do you have to hire an attorney to defend yourself or It'd probably be a good idea um, but you know there has to be a trade secret that you stole, essentially, that you misappropriated from your old employer in order for them to be able to prove that you did something wrong. Um, and that's, that can be difficult for them to prove. And their lawyer should not bring a lawsuit unless there is, a, there has to be a minimum amount of evidence that you've done something wrong. And so the likelihood of that happening is small unless you're a coder. <laughs> Unless you really you know, did something wrong. Unless you really did something <laughs> wrong. Um, you know, you stole their formula. You took their formula. That's not, you know, when you develop something as an employee of another company, of a company, generally speaking, you, that doesn't belong to you. It, you owe a duty to that company. It's theirs. You were, you, you were hired to work on that and to develop it. Um, I don't know the laws in Hawaii, actually, as well as I know the laws in California, but in California, Generally, most companies, too, will have you sign something that says, yep, everything I develop while I'm on the job, you know, using the company's um, machinery, using the company's computers and equipment, that all belongs to the company. But if you do something on your own at night and develop it on your own, then that's probably doesn't belong to, to your employer, but belongs to you. Yeah, so uh, you're a startup and you're too busy to deal with this lawsuit, so you just ignore them and continue doing what you're doing. If you don't reply, yes. does that mean you end up actually in more trouble? Yes. There's something <laughs> yeah. called a default judgment. If you don't reply to a lawsuit, then you run the risk that the court's going to say, you didn't answer, so I'm going to rule in favor of, of the plaintiff. Um, now, most courts will allow you 
to appear without a judge, or excuse me, without an attorney. They don't like that, though. They don't really love that, but people do that all the time. So even if you're in the right and somebody does sue you or threaten to sue you, they can make, make it difficult and expensive for you. And you pretty much have to, I think, respond to their, to their lawsuit, I think, once they've filed a lawsuit. That's yeah. yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, but the important thing is to make sure when you leave a company, I tell people this, don't take, don't take customer lists with you. Don't take formulas. Don't take forms. You just leave, you know, politely and... Um, yeah. But naturally, mm -hmm. if you're a programmer right. and you redevelop the same idea, uh, of course you're going to have a very similar code right. um, to the original one that you're Yeah, that's, that a, that's a tough one. And yeah. that, that, that issue is litigated all the time. Hmm. OK. Yeah, OK. All right, so, um, oh, yes, um, no problem, Thomas. Question, yes, uh, one question regarding the freedom to operate. So, yes. Um, does it just boil down to actually go on the web, because I know there's like government website where you have access to databases where you can check all the patterns that you file, because just that, so you should be just checking the usually it's, or you need a professional? Usually it's not just that. Okay. Uh, well, it, uh, you know, it, it could be just that if you, if you don't have the funds to proceed and, and you're not at the stage where investors are looking to invest in you. If you're at the stage where you're, you're going to get investments from, you know, investment bankers or VCs um, or, or just individuals who are sophisticated, they will probably want you to hire a patent searcher. These are professionals who, it's, it's an art, it's not a science. And they, um, they know the terms to use when searching the patent office records. And, and you really do get what you pay for. You know, so. and, it's, and it's an interpretation issue, too. So say you find five patents that are related to your technology, then you have to go and look at what the actual claims are at the end of the patent. And we'll talk about that a little bit, that really determine whether it really matters or not, whether you can ignore it or whether it's really relevant. And then if it is relevant, how do you, how do you deal with it? So. It's always yeah, good to do your own searching and make sure you're not, you're yeah, not. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll talk a little bit more. Got to, that your invention is novel. Yeah. yeah. So one of the, one of the primary things you're going to want to do when you're starting your business and is figure out your brand. What's the brand that you're selling? What's your, it's also known as a trademark. Um, so that's one, one type of IP. Another type of IP I just mentioned is trade secrets. So for some companies, like a sales company, your trade secrets are the identity of all of the people that you sell to your, your client, your customer list. OK, that's a trade secret. So that would not be something that you'd want to take to another company. Um, I'm sorry, trade secrets could also be a formula. You know, uh, I was just at Leonard's today buying a malasada, which I, I always do. And I don't know about you, but I've never had a malasada at any other place as good as Leonard's. So they have this recipe that, that absolutely is a trade secret. And were they to disclose that, let it out of the bag, they'd, I don't think they'd have as good a business anymore because people would take that trade secret and, and start making their own malasada. So that, that would be an example. A recipe, a formula would be a trade secret. Um, you, you know, a lot of businesses want to be first to market. You're the, the newest thing, the best thing since sliced bread. When you're third on the market, not so exciting, right? So, so there's a lot of incentive to want to be first, particularly in the medical device area and with pharmaceuticals. Um, the FDA gets involved, and being first on the market can mean the difference be, be, uh, of millions of dollars, billions sometimes. With, with hot pharmaceuticals. Um, pricing is going to be very important. Um, how you price your products could be intellectual property if it's a very sophisticated way of developing your pricing. Um, as I said, regulatory issues are very important. For example, the, the Food and Drug Administration regulates medical devices and pharmaceuticals. And being first to be approved is something that is very important and special. And so having regulatory approval is, in a way, IP. Um, your relationships, your sales networks, your relationships with your suppliers, um, uh, joint venture partners in developing your product, those are all very um, important 
um, assets to your business that can be regarded sometimes as IP. Your management team and employees. Um, the IP of our IP firm is our people. You know, our brilliant attorneys, our wonderful um, assistants, our support staff, administrative people like me that keep them out of trouble. <laughs> um, the, this is the, the value, the asset of our law firm. Okay? Um, and customer service can also be an asset or considered to be a competitive advantage. So I, I would just say that, so a lot of times when people hear IP, they think patents and then maybe trademarks. Uh, but all these things are really, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that give you a competitive advantage in your business that aren't patents and trademarks. Um, and you got to think about, you know, it's, it's the global business. You don't want to uh, necessarily just focus on patents or just focus on trademarks and say, okay, if we can't get a patent on this, that's the end of the business. You know, maybe you can't get a patent on it. Maybe you ultimately, after doing a freedom to operate, you say, okay, maybe we can't patent this, but, but maybe we can be the first to market. Or maybe, you know, we've got this great team and we've got a great distribution list and we've got a distributor and we know how to get this out there and we can still make a viable business based on, on what we have. And then finally, contract exclusivity. So what that means is, um, let's say you're going to make a brand new cleaning product and there's, there's a certain organic um, extract that there's, there's only one supplier for. And if you tie up that supplier and say you're only going to sell that extract to me, to my company, and not to anyone else for a certain period of time, that might be a way of giving you a competitive advantage and might be a real asset and value to your company. Um, there's rules called antitrust rules. You can't be anti-competitive um, under the federal antitrust laws, but um, you know, there's many companies that end up having exclusive supply agreements with their suppliers. Okay, um, so the important thing to remember, one big takeaway from this program tonight is this, is loose lips sink ships, meaning um, if you're a blabbermouth, if, if you're, it's great to be proud of your invention, and it's wonderful, but don't go talking about it too much without thinking ahead and, and protecting so really what you're discussing. Don't talk about it yeah, at don't all. Don't talk about it at all. <laughs> it at all. But, but we're, we're going to tell I mean, sometimes you have to, right? You have to talk with your supplier about what you need. So, but, but just keep in mind that when you disclose your ideas, it may prevent you from protecting your ideas. If you disclose your ideas, it may prevent you from protecting them, OK? And there are requirements under the patent law, and Andrew will go over them, but, but the biggest thing is novelty. You have to have invented something novel, something special, something that no one's done before. Okay, so that's important. And there's a, there's a concept called obviousness, which Andrew will go over. And if you don't have those two things, then you will not be able to get patent protection. And you definitely, as to novelty, you don't want to blab about your wonderful new invention because then somebody else can rush to the patent office and file before you. Because now, Andrew will go over this, whoever files first with the patent office generally gets the patent. Okay, it's a race to the patent office. And in the US, though, there is a one-year grace period after you invent before you have to file. But that's not the case in all countries. So there's good reason Andrew's going to go over this. As soon as you have determined what your invention is, it's really a good idea to file a provisional patent application to protect your ideas. And it, it sort of basically is a placeholder in the patent office and will prove that at that point in time, you had um, developed this invention. And evidence of that is your filing in the patent office. Um, and obviously, the biggest reason not to disclose is you know, it's amazing if something's hot, how quickly that will go around and get to people who might try to compete with you. So you definitely don't want to give your ideas um, out too freely or else your competitors will end up with them. Okay, so here are the kinds of things that can um, contain disclosures of your ideas and can cause you to lose rights. And, and a lot of people don't recognize this, but 
You will. You're going to be really smart at the end of the evening because you're going to know that these things are, are danger areas. Um, one of them is if you provide an abstract or a summary of your idea to, say, a joint venture partner, a possible joint venture po partner, that can cause you to lose rights. If you put your invention on a poster, something as simple as that, that could cause a loss of rights. If you give a presentation, um, not in a private setting, that can cause you to lose rights. If you, this is the worst thing, and, and grad students do this all the time. You have to do this. Professors do it all the time. If you publish what you've invented and you haven't protected it with a provisional patent application, you could lose rights to protect that, app, that invention. Publications are real danger areas, so you always want to get on file before you submit your manuscript. Grant applications, I hadn't thought of this one before, but if you are writing a grant to get funding for further development of what you've invented, that can give rise to a loss of rights. Your thesis or your dissertation, if it contains an invention that you haven't protected, that can blow your rights. If you offer to sell your product, even if you offer to sell something or sell something in what you consider to be a private transaction, there's a recent case that came down that said, guess what, that might be a public disclosure that causes you to lose your rights. Um, if you go to a trade show, I ran into this problem all the time. Um, I, had, I worked with a bunch of sales guys, and they're going to the SEMA show. And it dawned on them the day before that they hadn't filed a patent application on what they're about to show in their booth, right? So we had to get a provision on file. I had no idea that they were going to do this. But had they gone forward at the trade show without protecting their inventions, we would have lost rights to that invention. And that's true even if you can't figure out by looking at the product what the invention necessarily is. So it doesn't have to be obvious to you looking at it that this widget works in a certain way. If you show the widget and it incorporates the invention, that's likely to be a, a public disclosure. And then finally, if you have a testing company um, test your product, or you know a customer test your product, or if you collaborate with another company um, to develop your product, that could also cause you to lose rights. Okay, So these are all the danger areas. And it doesn't mean you can't do these things, because obviously everybody has to do at least one or two of these things. Uh, it just means you have to think about how to protect yourself first and make sure you do it under confidentiality if you're talking to a collaborator or that you've got something on file already if you're going to do a publication or do a poster at a conference or something like that. Oh, and well, lose your rights because somebody made a claim that it's not? Lose your rights because there's a, a requirement that things be new. And as part of what's new is something that hasn't been disclosed to the public before or published before. And so you have this, in the US, you have this grace period. But at some point, the patent office is going to say, if the patent office finds it, they might say, OK, this isn't new because you talked about this two years, two years ago. ago. So it's clearly not a new invention. Or what's more likely the case is you build this company around something. You bring something to market. You got a competitor. You sue the competitor on your patent that you got on your idea. And then that competitor goes and, and digs up a trade show where you presented your thing two years before you filed your patent. And now all of a sudden, they can argue that your patent's invalid. And so they should be able to do what they're doing. And you can't stop them. Oh, and here's one thing that we've actually seen happen is um, you know, your engineer or your R&D guy, your scientist, is having like a little bit of a, a brain block and a mental block. And so they go on a message board, and they share what they're doing with these other scientists. And they're like, what do you guys think? What should I do? Hey, guys, you know. And then people are chatting, well, well what do you mean? How does it work? And then you know, your employee says, well, this is how it works. And then, you know. You, that's super dangerous and can blow your rights right there. Do you have a quick question? Yes. Um, so for a startup, mm -hmm. um, you want to start this new business. So you go and study the market, do the market fit and analysis, competition and stuff. And now you're finding out about your competitors. You're finding what they sold. So automatically, you are copying other people's ideas. And now you start building your product. Yeah. So it sounds like until that stage, you lost your rights already, because you will have to do multiple of these. So <coughs> what is the perfect time for a startup, or what milestone, is to go and do the IP? To protect your IP? 
yes. before you go and talk about it. So I think but you will have to talk about it yeah. in order to hear from the, right. know, the market what you need to go. Well, so if you have an idea, you've got a crystallized idea, you say, okay, we're thinking about doing X. That's what we're going to build this company around, and we're going to shop that idea around to people and see what they think. Well, when you go and talk to those people, if you don't want to file something before yeah. file a patent application, you could do it under a, an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, and I think that'll yeah, maybe come next, that. where you make an agreement with the person that you're talking to that this is a confidential transaction, a confidential exchange of ideas, and they're not going to go and tell anybody else. And so what, what you run into, what most of these are about is, is a public disclosure where, you, where there's no expectation of confidentiality. As long as what you're doing is confidential and there's an expectation that it's confidential, then that shouldn't trigger a, a bar on getting a patent later or protecting your IP later. Okay, uh, I understand, but then it sounds like it's complicating the process of interviewing people. Like imagine you're going to interview a doctor and before you even start talking to him, you say, oh, by the way, you have to sign this NDA. It's a complicating <coughs> It is complicated, but it's less complicated than going back and figuring it out later, uh, or doing a lot. You know, having a lawsuit later about was it his idea or was it my idea? Uh, you know, if you go into it and you and you dot your eyes and cross your t's up front, it really saves on the back end, and you know you have to pay the lawyers a lot less to try to figure out who's who gets and, paid at the end of the and day. And sophisticated companies, suppliers, they're used to NDAs. So it's not an uncommon thing to and it's, and it's not like a 15-page form. You can have yeah, an NDA that's like a paragraph a that half. says, I'm going to meet with you for the purpose of telling you about my technology in X area, and you agree to keep that confidential and not to disclose it any, to anybody outside of your company. Sign. Nathan, did you have a question? I was just wondering okay. like, if anyone can write an NDA. Like, you don't need a legal... Uh, anyone can write an NDA. I don't think there's a requirement. And um, We're going to talk about let's, that. Yeah, I, have, I have a little story about that in just a sec. So. Okay. Here we go. Oh, we go. Insist on NDAs. Here we Perfect. Go. So insist on NDAs before you make disclosures to others. And make sure it's your NDA and not their NDA. Why? Yeah. Because there's two ways to write an NDA. There's a way to write an NDA um, that benefits the, the discloser, the one with the technology. And there's a way to write it that benefits the one who's going to receive the information. So and a good lawyer will make it a one-sided imbalanced NDA. So you want to get the type that protects you as the discloser. Yeah, so I had a new, a new client who came in and said, okay, I want to file this patent application, and then I'm going to go and talk to some potential um, partners, and I want to have an NDA. And oh, by the way, I, I signed this NDA with this other company, and so I think this is a pretty good NDA, so maybe we can just use that with, with the other folks. And so I said, okay, well, let's take a look at it. And he'd already signed this one, so it wasn't going back. And the NDA said basically that the other group could could disclose his confidential information to anyone within the company and any investors and any advisors. And there was like this whole long list of people that they could disclose his confidential information to that weren't party to the NDA and that weren't really defined. So the company could say, hey, this is an advisor. They're an advisor in my company, so I can tell them my trade secrets or that tell them the secrets that you told me. And then there's no, there's no prohibition on that person. That person isn't part of the NDA. Um, so, so basically, he came to me, and he had this NDA that he basically told the other side, they can do whatever they want, essentially, with the information that he's giving them. Um, and he hadn't any, had anybody look at it and didn't really recognize that. And you know, on first blush, it sounded legal. It sounded like it was covered, doing what he wanted it to do. He was, he was enthusiastic about it, even. And he had to go back and say, hey, you know, we should probably do something a little different next time. Um, so to, to get some help is, uh, you know, even when you, when you get your first NDA, if you haven't seen one before, come here. It sounds like there are folks here who could, uh, you know, give you a little advice or point you in the right direction and say, okay, this is kind of a standard, you know, it's a fairly standard form. I'm sure there are some around, floating around that you could have a look at and uh, just get a second opinion. So the important thing is to make sure you get that <coughs> application, a provisional patent application on file before you make any confidential disclosures. And then, as I said, that's evidence that's filed with the patent office that you, you had that idea at a certain point in time. And, and basically, a provisional application is not that complicated. It's, it's a, it could be a presentation. It could be a piece of paper that basically um, explains what, your, what the novelty is of your invention. And um, it, later on, you can defer the cost of filing a full-blown patent application for a year. 
defer that cost until you've figured out what it is that is unique about what you've invented and what you're claiming to be yours. OK, so as we said time and again, do not disclose your invention outside of using, uh, outside of confidential discussions. Use these, CDA, these NDAs, also known as CDAs, whenever you're talking with potential collaborators, licensees, and even investors when possible. And then just a common sense thing to do is if you're going to give confidential information under an NDA or CDA, make sure it says confidential on it. Okay, because a lot of a lot of arguments are had in litigation, um, maintaining that that wasn't confidential information. Didn't say confidential on so it. So your NDA might say, if you're going to give confidential information, it will be marked confidential, yeah. or you'll tell us that it's confidential. And then if you don't if you don't follow through on that, then somebody can come back later and say, hey, you, you know, this is what you told us you were going to do. You were going to write confidential on it if it was confidential, and you didn't write confidential on this. And and it's easy to get kind of sloppy about, about things like that because you're excited, you want to get it to them, it's a pain, um, but it can cause problems down the line. I have a funny story. My um, manager of one of my divisions said, I want to sue that employee because he left the company and he took our customer list with him, a list of all of our distributors across America. And I looked on our website, and you could figure out who each distributor was by clicking on the state, and you could get a list of all the distributors. So you could, you could reconstruct that customer list by going on the website. And I said, Jerry, that's not a, that's not a confidential customer list because it's available on the web. And this is back in the 90s. Um, so you, if you think that that is your IP, a customer list, and it's confidential and a trade secret, you got to treat it that way. Okay. All right. Um, Again, before you do any presentations, talks, publishing, meeting with collaborator, collaborators, licensees, inventors, file your patent applications. And then this is important to confirm inventorship, uh, who invented when, is maintain books, uh, research um, lab notebooks that show your, your researchers or your coders' notes that establish when it was that they developed what they developed. Um, and use caution when you're submitting um, papers, reports. As soon as you submit them, just assume that they're going to be uh, immediately available on the internet or otherwise. Will uh, emails count as notebook? Uh, An email to yourself is probably. No, no, no. Oh. to that group. To your to your group about like a status update of this is where the Probably. project is yes. yeah sure anything any evidence like that, that that things are happening at a certain time and date yeah okay and let's say a group of friends uh, had an idea and they decided to work on it and then after ten they did nothing after ten years one of them did it but after ten years and nothing started that time is there any danger in that case or. Uh, if, 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 if anybody talked about it outside of the group and, and disseminated it or talked about it with somebody else, there's a possibility that it's a problem. But you know, if, if really it was like sitting down at dinner and talking with three people and saying, here's an idea, and then 10 years later, one of them goes with it, that's probably, there's and, probably and not a And he's going to get into what, so. what a protectable idea is. It yeah. can't just be like, I can say, oh, um, I have an idea that we should have a drug that cures cancer. That doesn't give me the right to file because I haven't figured out yeah. how to do it. Yeah. Right. So there's a difference between an idea and, and an actual invention or innovation. OK, I'm going to move on a little bit um, so that we can get on to the meat of today's talk. <laughs> so um, you know, as I mentioned, types of IP, we've got trademarks and trade dress. We all know Coke. Is a, is a trademark of the Coca-Cola company. Candy Crush is the trademark for that game that's real popular. Um, so trademarks and trade dress even, and we're going to take a look at some of those things. Trade dress means how, how a product looks. Um, even your marketing, your, your product and service branding, a service mark could be, and we're going to go over examples of that, could be. IP, your reputation and goodwill, the reputation of your company can actually be something that's protectable. A color that you're using, 
Um, a good example of that is the insulation, the Pink Panther. What's pink, the pink brand? Pink insulation, yeah. I don't There's know. a type of brand that's, that's insulation that's pink, and that was deemed by the courts to be a protectable trademark, believe it or not. Um, Immoral judgment. There's a question. There's a, an issue with some trademarks about whether oh, you can right. patent something that's obscene, for example, I would patent or trademark something that's obscene or something that is associated with an illegal product, like um, like could you trademark a brand or a, a strain of marijuana, for example? And they won't let you do that. So if there, are, uh, so there is some limitation on what you can trademark in terms of. I taught Andrew products. at Hawaiian word today, Pakalolo. <laughs> 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 um, Okay, so yeah, there, there. You can't right now. You can't register a trademark for a type of marijuana, but you can register a trademark for a type of pipe, for, for a vaping. related goods and services. You yeah. call it so for paraphernalia for, uh, or t-shirts or may something may not be like legal that. to sell it, but anyway, you could get a trademark on it. Um, and copyrights. So copyrights protect works of art artistic expression. So that could include books, <coughs> could include music, code, software code, or even cheerleader uniforms. That was surprising to me. So I guess a look and style of, of a cheerleader uniform could be protectable under copyright. So even if you're, your business is about clothing, if you're doing something really distinctive and you've got a certain look, that might be something that's copyrightable. And I had a little visual for you. Um, so. One of the things you may not know about me, I'm not sure you, I think you know Peter, but my husband's a filmmaker, and this is the movie poster for our film. It's on Amazon, it's called Hello, My Name is Frank. But um, this poster, the artwork on it, is, is a protectable work that is protected as a copyright, okay? Um, also, the screenplay, the underlying screenplay for this movie is something that we registered with the US Copyright Office. It's very easy to do, very inexpensive, $35. Um, and so that's protectable as well. Um, the music in the movie, it's not our copyright, but the artists have copyrights on their music, um, both on the recording of the music and on the actual composition. So there's all kinds of copyrights involved with entertainment, um, movies, television shows, and music. Okay, trade secrets. Um, you don't necessarily have to get a patent. So if you don't have the money to get a patent, um, you might be able to protect your innovation as a trade secret, particularly code. Um, but you have to keep it confidential, and you have to treat it as a trade secret, just like the um, Leonard's Malasada recipe. Okay, so that would include customer lists, manufacturing methods, how you make something, or a drink formula. Okay, and we listed Waymo LiDAR. So the, the new big thing is self-driving vehicles, right? You've seen them. Um, they've had some measure of success, and, and many people think that's the wave of the future. Well, there was a fellow who worked at Google on their self-driving um, automobile program, and he left and took many of those secrets with him and went to Uber and started working for them. And there was this big litigation between Google and Uber. And it was settled eventually. But that's, that's a clear example of how, how one can get in trouble by moving from company to company. And then, um, as I mentioned, patents. That's, that's one of the um, most important things, I think, in terms of IP that you have to think about. Um, basically, anything, any invention under, under the sun, made by a man, is protectable, theoretically, with a patent. So that would include ideas. OK, so very are we, quickly. Are we, are we going to six, or do we have? I think, yeah, we're not even uh, So I'm going to kind of speed through. So okay. trademarks would be you know, the swoosh, the words just do it, the Apple symbol. This is one of our largest clients, Monster Energy, the drink company. And the neat thing about trademarks is they last forever as long as you're using it. Once you stop using it, your rights will expire. Okay, so you have to keep using it. Um, and then there's different, different strengths of a trademark. The best trademarks are things that are nonsense. Um, I get, I Hagen Daz is just a made up, I just a made up name. Okay, yeah. so Hagen Daz is just totally made up. That's a wonderful trademark. What you don't want to have is a trademark like escalator that becomes, ends up being a generic term. 
I didn't know that was once a trademark either. And then you have what's kind of in between. Microsoft kind of implies software. You know, that's not a great trademark. If you can figure out what a company does, it, it's a real tension. Because when you name your company, you kind of do want people to know what you do by the name of your company. But on the other hand, it's not necessarily a good protectable trademark if you can tell exactly what that company does by their trademark. Okay? American Airlines, you know what they do. <laughs> the American parts, though, you know. And the stronger, the longer people use those marks, like American Airlines or Microsoft, the, the stronger, the more incontestable they become, right. the stronger they become. Right. So once they have that second, that meaning associated with them. Okay. Um, and with respect to um, trademarks, why would you want to register it? Um, because it will show that you own that mark with respect to that type of goods. And it'll, it'll be evidence that that mark, that registration is valid. And that validity becomes incontestable after five years. So if after five years, nobody complains, that is your mark. And it's deemed to be valid. Um, one thing you might want to do, if you have something that's easily cop copyable, copied, <laughs> and, um, and you think there could be knockoffs made, especially in China or, or other places, you might want to register your mark with the customs, US Customs Service. And that way, if they see products with the same mark as you have coming into the US, you might be able to stop it at customs, stop it from coming in. Um, and just as with patents, your investors will view your marks, especially for companies like Monster Energy Company or Starbucks. You know, that's a really critical asset for that company. It, it, it's, it is the value of those companies. Um, and don't forget domain names. When, you, when you're really at your infancy, once you get a mark and you really like it, reserve that domain name. Because if you don't, you're, you know, there are pirates out there. Once you're successful, they'll try and sell you the domain name that they reserved that you forgot to reserve and they'll extract a pretty penny for it. I also I, heard GoDaddy's not so great these days because they will charge you a pretty high price if you go through them as opposed to getting it yeah. on your own. Have you I, heard I that? don't know. Okay. No, I That's don't know. what I hear from our trademark. But I would also say that when, you, when you're thinking about trademarks, it's, it's really quick and pretty inexpensive to, to do a search and see if somebody else is already using that mark. So before you invest a lot of time and money in, right. in branding and, and sticking with a name, um, have somebody do a quick trademark search for you. I think, it's, I think it's really inexpensive and really fast, and you can at least have some comfort that two years later you're not going to find out that there's a big, a big company in California that's, that's using the same name, and you're going to have to change yours and start, start over with your branding. A trademark doesn't give you any kind of uh, domain name claim. Uh, not unless you bought, I mean, if somebody else has already bought that domain name before you, then Even yeah, they there's not. Yeah, even though they didn't trademark it, I think if they own it, I think if you tried to buy a different, you know, a domain name that's trademarked and tried to to use that to like piggyback they, on their yeah, goodwill, they, then there there could be an issue there. But um, if they created a new extension, like you know, remember how .net became the new thing, and now there's .tv. If there was a new thing and you tried to do, you know, Coca Cola dot X Y Z, then Coca Cola may try to object and claim that um, you misappropriated their mark by trying to get a trademark. OK, so design marks. These are all copies or um, samples of logos and then words, two different kinds of trademarks. And many companies register both their design and their words. Um, believe it or not, you can actually get a trademark on a sound, the roar of the MGM lion is trademarked, as well as the giggle of the Pillsbury Doughboy. I didn't know that. And then um, slogans, of course. These types of famous slogans are, are registrable. Um, OK, and all yours. So how, is everybody willing to stick around for five minutes so we can talk about patents? <laughs> Quick. Um, if you need to leave, feel free to get up and go. Uh, so. Let's see, utility patents. So there are a bunch of different kinds of patents. There's a utility patent, which is what people think about when they hear the term patent most of the time. It's, it's uh, describing a, a machine, a widget, a way of doing something. It could be a method. Uh, it could be a, a composition, a, a material that you develop. Uh, 
And then there are a few other kinds. There's design patents and plant patents uh, that are a little bit different. Uh, but the, the idea with the patent system was that you get a limited monopoly. You get to, to exclude other people from doing what you've invented for a certain amount of time. And in exchange, you have to tell everybody how you did what you did and describe your invention. And that way, people can take that and build on it and, and go forward and, and innovate based on what you came up with. So, uh, so it's an exchange. So when people talk about, sometimes in the, in the popular press, people will say, oh, well, this, this is already patented, and it's not fair. This is tied up, and it sounds like it's going to be tied up forever. But really, it's a, it's a limited monopoly. It's for 20 years from the filing date. And then it's available to the public. And in the meantime, there's a disclosure to the public of how to do it. And people can, can look at that and say, OK, how do we improve on this even further? Uh, so instead of keeping something secret in the company, it gets it out there, and, and there can be improvements. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, Patents are super valuable for a company. A lot of times, investors want to see them, whether they're really solid patents or not. Sometimes it's just a checkbox. Do they have patents that, that uh, potentially cover their product? Uh, you know, exclude, exclude competitors, so it gives you some, some market exclusivity. Uh, you can license them, maybe you make uh, some money, and it might be an invention that isn't necessarily super central to what your, the direction of your company, but something that you invented on the side uh, or that, that came out of your, your uh, R&D. Uh, and maybe it's a source of, of separate revenue where you can, can license that off and let somebody else run with that while you take your company in a, in a somewhat different direction. So uh, lots of value to having uh, patents and, and even demonstrating professionalism. I think when, when you're talking to investors and you can say, okay, we're pursuing some patents, we've got these ideas, and we're moving forward in protecting those ideas, you know, it, it can show people that you're serious. Uh, I even had a, a client who got patents because they had such an innovative uh, biotech uh, ideas that they couldn't get their ideas published in a, in a regular journal. So they would file these patents, patent applications and, and get these patents that they could then take around and say, okay, you know, this is evidence of what we're doing and it's important enough to, to have patented. Um, so important, one important thing about a patent is that it, it doesn't give you the right to do anything. So even if you've invented something and gotten a patent on it, it doesn't mean that you can practice your invention. What you can do is keep other people from doing what your patent says. So it's a right to exclude other people and, uh, and it doesn't give you any rights. So as an example, if you uh, determine that there's a, a particular compound that works really well as a pencil, it writes underwater, it writes really dark, um, there might be somebody else who has a patent on that chemical compound, on the material that you figured out you can use as a pencil. So you might get a patent on the use of this material as a pencil, but you can't actually make your pencils using that material because somebody else has a patent on the specific compound. And in that case, you'd have to go and talk to those guys and say, OK, I see that you have a, you know, a patent on, on this material. Can I get a license to that? Because I've got my own invention. Uh, but you can't do it without their, without their help. So having a patent doesn't mean you can do what you've invented. Uh, let's see. I'm, you know, I'm going to skip over a couple things just because we, uh, in the interest of time. So the requirements for a patent, it has to be new, not obvious. We talked about that a little bit. You have to describe it. You have to tell people how to do it. Uh, it has to have a utility. It has to be useful. Uh, but that's kind of a, 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 it used to be kind of a weak standard. It was an, it, an easy bar to get over in terms of what's useful. Now there are, there are a few different kinds of patents, like business models and software, where things are kind of more idea-based. And the patent office has come back and said, hey, if it's just an idea, if it's abstract, if it's, if it's not connected to some product somehow or some physical action, then maybe that's not patentable. And so there's a lot of debate now about how you decide what's really uh, useful in terms of and what's really patentable in terms of software, business methods, like a method of you know, managing a stock portfolio or something like that where it's where it's not really a concrete thing, it's, it's something that you can do in your head, is that really a, an invention uh, that can be protected by a patent? <clears throat> so, but in terms of the, 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 whether it's useful or not obvious, here are a couple examples of things that were found to be useful and not obvious. This is from 1996, this is two potato chips with some marshmallow filling in between. Somebody got a patent on that, they persuaded the patent office that was not only new in 1996, but not obvious and useful. 
So, so in some aspects, you know, that it's hard to balance. Why is this useful, but my software or my, uh, you know, my stock portfolio management system is not useful? Well, it's just kind of the way it is at this point. Uh, the one on the, on the right is a self-contained enclosure for protection from killer bees. So it's like a bubble. You zip yourself into the bubble. So is that, maybe it's useful if you're encountering killer bees a lot. Is it not obvious to zip yourself into a plastic suit? Well, somebody managed to convince the patent office that it was. I don't know how many they sold in the end, but um, anyway. So, it's, 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 so the standards are, are variable depending on the industry. In the, in the killer bee industry, industry they were able to, uh, to get this. Uh, so here's, so I wanted to run through what a patent looks like. So if you're out there and you're looking, somebody might send you a patent with a letter saying, hey, we heard you're doing this, we're operating in this area, here's our patent, check it out. Uh, or maybe you're, you know, you're looking on your own at the patent office website or Google Patents is a great place to look for patents. They have a separate uh, google.patents.com and, and you can search there and see what kind of patents are out there. Uh, but this, this is kind of what the front of a patent looks like and it, and it tells the, the title. Uh, that gives an abstract, and this is uh, also a mid-90s patent for a method of exercising a cat. And, and the abstract tells a little bit about what they think their invention was. So it says a method for inducing cats to exercise by moving a laser around in the vicinity of the cat and to uh, moving it so as to uh, cause the bright patterns of light to move in an irregular way, fascinating to cats. And then the animal will chase it. So, so when you look at the front, you can look at the abstract and usually get an idea of what people are thinking their invention is. So it gives you the inventors. And up here, it'll often it'll tell you who the inventors are and also who the assignee is oftentimes. So if it's assigned to a company, if there's a company that owns this, uh, that'll show up on the face of the patent. It tells you when it was filed, when it was issued. There are some figures. Here's a figure of somebody moving the laser for the cat. And then in the patent itself, there's a lot of description. So then they talk about what the invention is, how they made it, how you use it. And sometimes people, even fairly sophisticated people, will look at that and say, hey, these people covered, got a patent on just moving a laser for a cat or on a heart valve or you know, whatever is described there. They feel like, oh, that must be what the patent is, is covering. And that's not really true. The description is, is them telling about their invention but what the patent covers is strictly defined by the claims at the end of the patent. So if somebody tells you, hey, have you seen this patent? It's really broad. It covers all these things that they described in there. Look at the back. Look at the end of the patent and look at the numbered claims. And that's where the invention is really described. And so that's really telling you what they can exclude other people from doing. And the words in the claims really matter. So here, this is what was claimed in this patent, what the patent issued with. And it says, a method of inducing aerobic exercise in an unrestrained cat. And the words matter. So if you're doing, you know, if you've got your cat running around so fast that it's anaerobic, that wouldn't count. It's got to be aerobic exercise. And you've got to figure out what that means. What does aerobic mean? It's got to be an unrestrained cat. So if your cat's on a leash, you can't infringe this patent assuming that's restrained. Or if you've got it restrained in other ways, duct tape or something, then you can't, you can't infringe this patent. Uh, you have to have a coherent beam of invisible light, and you have to, uh, has to be out of the cat's immediate reach, and you have to induce the cat to, uh, to run and chase. And so if, you, if somebody were going to try to enforce this patent, they would have to show that you or whoever they were suing does all of those things. And so really, when, you, when you're looking at patents, look at the claims at the end. And those are really, that's really the important bit that, that really tells you what the patent is about and what they can cover. And, and for, if you're looking at it in terms of what is my business and is this really relevant to me, look at those claims and say, do I do what it says in those claims? And sometimes maybe it takes a little bit to figure out what the words mean and whether you really do or not uh, do what it says. Uh, so the, the claims are super important. Um, when you're going after patents, patents that have really broad claims uh, seem to cover a lot, but at the same time, they might be easier to invalidate because it's easier to find prior art where somebody has done something that falls within the scope of that. Uh, so there's this idea of, of a claim that has lots of alternatives. So if it's really narrow, it's really focused, it says you, know, you have to use a red laser for the cat and the cat has to be black, that's easier to design around. You can use a green laser with a white cat and then you wouldn't infringe. Um, 
But if, there, if it just says a cat, then a white cat or a black cat would be infringing. So, so depending on how the, the claim language is, if there's lots of alternatives, that, that might be a weaker claim. If you're covering a critical step in a, in a process or something, that could be a really, a really uh, important claim that could cover lots of different, uh, different processes, for example. Um, let's see, what else can we cover here? Uh, Wendy talked a lot about this already. I think the purpose of the IP is that really investors are interested in it. Uh, it's covering your product. It might com cover a competitor's product. If you've got a, a patent application on file and you see that a competitor comes out with something that's within what you've described, you might be able to get a, a patent that's directed to them if you wanted to try to, to stop them. Um, licensing, cross-licensing. Uh, what else? So here's some, some other types of patents real quick. Uh, this is a design patent. So uh, some of the Apple-Samsung litigation that's been in the news a lot is based on this kind of patent where it's really just the ornamental features of something. So this is a really inexpensive patent. It's $1,000 maybe, something like that, to get. Uh, and it covers the, the design of things. So it's popular, popular kind of pro, uh, patent for, uh, for example, uh, car wheels. The different, the different spoke designs in car wheels. So it's, it's whatever is not functional, but just gives it the certain look that you're interested in. And so that might be the rounded edge of the iPhone or the, uh, the user interface, the way the apps are, uh, are laid out. And those things have been tremendously valuable for, for Apple, uh, having these, these simple, very simple design patterns that are really essentially just a picture. Let's see. There's also plant patents. So if you're in the in the ag space uh, and you've uh, come up with a new plant, you can get a plant patent or a plant variety rights certificate, uh, and that can can uh, cover the the new variety that you've come up with. Uh, there's lots of interesting licensing issues around plants since you can grow plants, and if people have access to your plants, they can take them somewhere else and grow them. Uh, so, so I do a decent amount of that. So if anybody does plants and, and has questions, I'm happy to, to talk about that some more afterwards. Um, so we, there are two different aspects. One that we talked about already, I guess, a little bit blocking using your patents to keep other people out. And then what is my freedom to operate? Can I do what I want to do? Uh, We've talked about that a, a bit already. Let's see. So <clears throat> I think we've covered most of these things, evaluating freedom to operate. So, so once, you, once you've got an idea and you want to know, uh, can I do this? You, know, you can do some Google searching for patents and see what else is out there and see if people have patents in your space already. And then, but before you, before you really do a big investment, it might be worth talking to somebody and, and really identifying you know, what's, what's out there. What, what do people, if I try to bring this to market, is somebody going to come down on me and, and stop me after I've already invested you know, a, a bunch of money in this, in this process? And so uh, the timing of that, you know, how much you want to spend at different amounts of time will totally depend on how much budget is available to you. Uh, but it's but it's a, a exercise that's definitely worth going through. So that's you know looking for issued patents at the U.S. If you're gonna if you're thinking about doing something internationally, are there patents in Europe that might stop you? Are there patents in Japan or Australia or wherever your market might be? Um, and then if there are, uh, let's see, what do we got? If there are things out there, you have to figure out how you're gonna how you're gonna deal with it. So this is some some time when you want to look at the freedom to operate uh, aspect at the start of the product, at the start of the project. When you're first thinking about your your idea, maybe you do some some cursory investigation and you feel pretty good that that you got some room to to do what you want to do. If you've got a prototype and you're thinking about scaling up, then it might make sense to to do a little deeper dive and really make sure before you really make a, that big investment that that you can, uh, can make your product. And before you set up your, you know, your manufacturing processes, does somebody have a patent that's going to cover the way I want to do this? Am I going to have to pay somebody royalties? Uh, it's probably better to talk to them before you have a, the next big thing uh, rather than later, because they'll be asking for more money later than they will be up front. Um, so prior to launch, certainly. And then post-launch, keeping up with what competitors are doing and, and what they might have that, that's impacting you. Uh, 
What if you find a, find a problem? Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna stop you from doing what you want. If there's a problem patent out there, it just means you gotta think about it a little bit. Is there a reason to think that that patent is really not valid? Uh, has that patent been litigated before? Did a, did a court decide that the terms in that patent mean a certain thing that might be more or less relevant to you? Uh, you could challenge the patent in court if you've got the money. You could do an IPR, which we talked about. Uh, and to get a little more comfort, you can get a, an opinion from a lawyer who, who will look at the claims of the patent and you know, using the guidance that the, that the courts have provided in various cases over the years, try to figure out exactly what the claims mean and how relevant they are to, to your product and whether it's really something you need to worry about. Um, and, and you can wait and see sometimes too and see where your product ends up. Maybe you go in a different direction. Uh, maybe they drop that patent and don't do it. Maybe you guys talk and decide to cooperate rather than be competitors. Uh, so, so waiting and seeing what happens is, is a possibility. We're designing around licensing. Uh, so let me, if, if everybody's willing to wait two more minutes, we can do a little bit about ownership. So ownership initially resides with the inventors. So the inventors are the owners unless they've assigned to somebody else. And so that uh, can have a, uh, an impact on employment agreements, consulting agreements, development agreements. So anytime you're collaborating with somebody else, you need to think about who owns the things that's coming out of that collaboration. If I'm, if I'm working with another company or another person or bringing on a consultant, how do I make sure that my company, that I'm getting the IP and it's not gonna be an issue later where they're gonna come back and say, hey, I, I, I developed this, I should be getting uh, the ownership of this and have more investment in it. Um, so, Who's an inventor? An inventor is, is somebody who has really contributed significantly basically to the invention. So it's not somebody who is working at your direction, but somebody who has con helped conceive of, of the invention. So it's not a technician in the lab who's doing what you're saying, but somebody who has, who has uh, really contributed to, uh, to really the ideas of the invention. Um, let's see. So again, beware of unintended co-inventors. If you've got you know, any kind of collaborators uh, that, are, uh, that are working with you, make sure you've got it clear who's gonna, who's gonna own the outcome of, of their work. Uh, patents can be assigned. An assignment is a conveyance of the rights in the, to the IP. Yeah? Yeah, quick question on the ownership. So how do you make that, let's say, legal? You say, okay, this is the, you know, the inventor, like, you know, this is the Mostly it's, mostly it's through an assignment. So you'll have them assign a an agreement, a contractor agreement or an employment agreement if it's somebody who's gonna work for you as an employee. Um, and, and the important thing is to have an assignment clause where it, let's see, so here's, so this is an example of an assignment where somebody says, in return for consideration, I hereby sell, assign, transfer to you all the rights. And so that's in a typical employment agreement. Let's see if I've got that. Yeah, so in an employment agreement, it'll say anything that I'm doing for you, I assign to you or the company. Uh, and also an employment agreement should say, you know, I'll keep things confidential uh, and I won't disclose it to anybody else. But, but the assignment part is, uh, is crucial and it should say that I, let's see, I hereby assign all my rights. And so people have gotten in trouble with having assignments that say I will assign in the future rather than saying I do assign. And so that's uh, one takeaway is that if you're gonna have an assignment provision, it should really say I do assign right now my, uh, my inventions to the company. Um, what if there's no agreement? Is there any, anything that kind of well, there's, if, there. if there's no agreement, that it basically reverts to the inventor. It's an inventorship issue then. And so the, the problem there is that you can have joint inventors. So if you collaborate with somebody and you don't have an agreement, you might be an inventor and they might be an inventor. You might both be an inventor. And you have rights in the patent, but they have equal rights in the patent. So you might start a company and base it on your invention and your patent. And they could then license the same patent to a competitor because they are also joint owners of the patent because they were, were joint inventors and they never assigned to you. Uh, so that's where it can get tricky because each person can, can do what they want with the patent as a joint owner. So having a, 
uh, an agreement in place where it says, you know, I'm working for you on this and I hereby assign anything that I do to the company, to you, uh, is really going to be a uh, save some problem down the line. Um, let's see. Disclosure is important. So if you have uh, an agreement with somebody, you want them to tell you about, agree that they'll tell you about what they're doing and, and any inventions that they come up with so that they're not uh, keeping things from you. So that's part of their agreement. So they, they'll tell you about it and they'll assign it to you. Uh, let's see. Maybe we just call it there. We've gone, gone over quite a bit. Uh, licensing, purchase agreements, we'll skip. Well, maybe we can talk about budgeting a little bit. Provisional patents are, uh, are like Wendy mentioned, can be more or less extensive. A lot of times uh, it can be just a few paragraphs or a couple pages that describe your invention and can serve to show that you came up with this idea before you went and talked to the giant corporation, which then steals your idea. And so you've got some evidence that before you went and talked to them, you had this idea first. Um, it, it also can serve to buy you some time inexpensively to, uh, to further develop your ideas over the course of a year uh, before you file a, a complete patent application. So a provisional application is pretty inexpensive. Uh, a patent application in the US, I would say on average is like fifteen to $20,000 to file a uh, single patent application, a utility application, and then at the end of the day to get the patent out the other end, it might be twenty-five dollars to $50,000 uh, for one. And then if you file foreign, if you're saying, okay, maybe we'll want to have a factory in Singapore that does this or market in Australia, uh, you want to have patent protection in other countries, then those, those numbers start climbing really exponentially. The foreign prosecution is really expensive. So a lot of times I see uh, new companies that have grand ambitions and they end up spending a lot of money uh, with these foreign filing strategies when if you really think about it realistically, it's going to be a long time before they're in some other country and what is the likelihood that they're actually going to sue somebody you know, in, uh, well, in China, for example, uh, or, or Australia or South Africa or wherever they're, they're filing. And so they're spending a lot of money on these foreign filings. Uh, and, and really, business-wise, it would make more sense to think about, really, what are my key, key areas? And given the budget that I've got, let's really focus on those. Um, there are some, some ways to speed prosecution of patents if you've got something that, that you really want to get to market really fast. If there are some markets move really quickly and you really need to get it out there, you can spend a little more money to get things uh, through the patent office potentially a little faster. Uh, once you start getting into challenging patents, uh, you know, it starts getting into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, getting somebody to do freedom to operate and things like that, though, is, you know, is really variable. And even if you don't have a, a big budget for that, you know, spending a little time thinking about it and getting some input is, is still valuable and, and doesn't, have to, uh, doesn't have to break the bank. Uh, so IPRs that we mentioned are you know, a few hundred thousand dollars to six or eight hundred thousand dollars probably, and then litigation if you end up being in a lawsuit with somebody is, is usually two million dollars plus. So, so IPRs are popular with people because instead of spending two, three, five million dollars, they might be able to spend three hundred thousand dollars to get rid of the patents that are, that are in the suit. Um, so I'm sorry we kind of, kind of rushed through the end, but I know we're, we're way over. So thank you very much for, uh, for hanging around and listening and being attentive. I appreciate it. And, uh